words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. I ask that you would meet us here and that you would inspire us, that you would send a word among your people, whether it's one that I speak or whether it is one sent from you. Amen. Our various scripture readings are unified, I would propose to you, by a general inquiry into the nature of divine economics in the kingdom of God. Every kingdom, after all, mints coins and collects taxes, provides loans and levies debt. So in the kingdom of God, what are these networks of exchange supposed to look like now that the Messiah has come and established the reign of God. Are we to continue on as if nothing has changed? Or instead, does the faithful disciple of Christ exhibit, exhibit a new and different orientation towards work, accumulation, leisure, luxury, and the like? The psalmist said, those of low estate are but a breath, those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not put your heart on them. And Paul declared, be as those who buy, as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it at all. For the present form of this world is passing away. And the gospel story depicts Jesus announcing the coming of the kingdom of God to a group of fishermen who abandoned their industry in order to turn their skills to a more holy task. Simon, Andrew, James, and John, no longer anglers of fish, but evangelizers to the destitute and the downtrodden. They were disciples of true faith and clear vision who chose to lay down their own economic security to advance the new work of the kingdom of God. I note this emphasis on work here because it does not appear that the kingdom of God inaugurates an era of leisure. As the psalmist concluded this morning's passage, power belongs to God and steadfast long love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. And so I would hazard to suggest that at least one of the themes foregrounded by these passages is the assertion that God knows and assesses the value of our true work, our holy work, regardless of whether it has led us to be wealthy or penniless. It is the business, not in the sense of a for-profit company, but the busyness, quite literally, the etymology of the term means the state of being busy to the appointed task, which in this case is the advancement of Christ's kingdom. And it is he, Christ, who serves as divine assessor in the economy of grace and who redeems, quite literally buys back those who call upon his name. Now I'm laying on the economic metaphors pretty thick, but the scriptures are rife with them. And the church has always had to contend with these metaphors in every era. What do we do with this language of work, of money, of possessions? Now, I'm not trying to start a financial campaign this morning. These are just the scriptures that we've been confronted with by the lectionary. Though they've also been somewhat timely in some reflection that I've been engaging with Judy on in regards to the thrift store and our mission. You see, this question of our relationship to work and to money, it's Really, it, it was a very pressing issue for the Wesley brothers. 
Methodism got its start during the Industrial Revolution and the manner in which faithful disciples ought to orient themselves to this new style of commerce was a major question. The English Industrial Revolution was a deeply compromised endeavor. It certainly brought a lot of wealth and a lot of social mobility, but it also led to an explosion of exploitative child labor, extraordinary pollution of air and water, indentured servitude, and it was part of, or connected to, ongoing British colonial projects. And as a result of that, many people were made socially vulnerable. As the centuries-old class system and the entirety of the British social order were upended. And that is precisely where Methodism thrived because those early followers, they heard and believed and accepted the call to walk as Christ had walked. To not simply fulfill their civic and social obligations, but in fact, to take up their cross and follow Christ out into the world. And then when they did that, they took to the streets and the warrens and the slums to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and tend to the sick. They built orphanages and hospitals and they did everything in their power to provide what we would now think of as social services, because those didn't really exist back then. I've seen more than one scholarly treatise, treatise credit Methodism as being the first public health campaign, or the first modern one at least. And to this day, our church's global health initiatives remain one of our evergreen contributions to the world. Now with that in mind, one might expect that John Wesley would have some issues with the emerging economic system that was creating so much harm, even as it generated so much wealth. And he certainly did. Though his proposed remedy was rather unexpected and somewhat surprising. You see, he told his followers to go out and make as much money as they could. He told his followers to go out and make as much money as they could. As a working class and small business oriented movement, Wesley called upon everyone to dedicate themselves to their worldly vocations. Whatever it is that you do, do it better than anyone else. Be more faithful and disciplined in the performance of your duties. Arrive early, stay late. Show forth the disciplined life in every aspect of your work. And so to distinguish themselves in their industriousness, many Methodists embraced this hyper-disciplined lifestyle that wouldn't be too unfamiliar to some of our present day advocates of the 5 a.m. wake up time and the lifestyle of the grind. And yet the rationale, our rationale for doing those things differs quite drastically from those proponents of self-development because in our world, it's not supposed to be about self. It's not supposed to be about us in the first place. You see, it's true that John told people to go out and make as much money as he could, as they could, but there's more to that story. Because there's always the temptation to become overly preoccupied with the acquisition of wealth to become an end in and of itself, to, for it to become the goal. And working hard to gain as much as they could was never John's goal. And in fact, the second part of his movement, of this Wesleyan economic ethic he was developing, has to do with saving as much as we can. Earn as much as you can, but it's not just so that you can go buy nice things, and it's certainly not just for the sake of having money in and of itself. He says, save as much as you can, or put otherwise. Here's a fun quote from him. Abstain from fashionable diversions, from reading plays, romances, or talking in a merry, gay, diverting manner. Your plainness of dress, 
your manner of dealing in trade, your exactness in observing the Lord's day. You're doing pretty good at that one, by the way. Your scrupulosity. That's a fun one. Your scrupulosity as to things that have not paid custom, your total abstinence from spiritous liquors, unless, unless in cases of necessity. I'm not sure what the necessity would be. Now, I'm certainly willing to temper the specifics of these injunctions. It's okay for you to go to the theater, right? And I think Wesley was himself preaching an exaggerated version of his theological ethics. He did, after all, read a lot. <laughs> But what can and should be affirmed is that the overall thrust of his teaching in this regard is that we don't gain all we can so they can be spent on ever-increasing luxuries. Today, we often call this lifestyle creep. It's where I always seem to be broke, now how many, no matter how many promotions or raises I get, because each time I gain more, I spend more. As soon as that slightly larger check starts rolling in, I go out and I buy a nicer car or a more spacious home or a more stylish wardrobe. And more often than not, our egos get entangled in these possessions. Some would say they begin to possess us. And suddenly, my understanding of my own personal and social value becomes dependent on the niceness of my car the spaciousness of my house and how great I look in the cut of my sweater. And yet the scriptures are clear, both the ones this morning and throughout pretty much throughout the whole corpus of it. Those of high estate are a delusion. If riches increase, do not put your heart on them. To be concise, the general line of thinking led to Wesley's second principle, save all you can. And this certainly includes making sure we've set aside an emergency savings account. Please go do that. If you can, set aside enough money that if you lose your job, you'll be able to take care of yourself for about six months while you find a new job. And it certainly accounts, includes actively investing for your retirement accounts. Do that. Take advantage of your matching amounts from your employer, get an IRA, put as much money as you can into that each year. Start early, Alana. It will build over time, right? Do those things. But when I say save all you can, when John says save all you can, that's not really what it's about. It's not just about hoarding up wealth to safeguard the future. It's not about storing up riches. And importantly, I think this is what Paul had in mind in the first Corinthians passage, when he said, be as those who buy, as though they had no possessions. It's the idea that living the faithful Christian life is that in trusting God and leaning into that spirit of presumptive generosity, that even those good things that fall into our hands, we don't grasp onto them but continue to lift them up to God and look for how they can be made available for the good of everybody. There's a certain faithfulness, and I mean that not in the sense of doing what you're supposed to do, but in the sense of having faith that we don't need to cling to these possessions, these things that we buy, but that they can pass through our hands and we trust that God will take care of us and also that our, the community will take care of us. We take care of each other. But we can also think of these principles more along the lines of that environmental model, motto, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Save all you can, save the planet, <laughs> that'd be nice. Or do more with less, get a little thrifty, 
Don't buy new when pre-owned is just as good. But again, we, we do all this. We gain all we can and we save all we can so that we can actually be prepared to fulfill the final and most important principle. Give all you can. That's, that's the whole point. And if we don't get there, if we don't get to this climax of the Wesleyan economic ethic, the rest becomes vanity and sin. Just gaining all you can and saving all you can, that alone is sin. But instead, it's in this final movement where Methodism inverts or perhaps even subverts the earthly logic of the Industrial Revolution, for it embraces industriousness. It embraces having a strong work ethic. Methodists have typically been identified with having a very strong work ethic. That's true. And I don't want to lose that, even if there are some of us who work a little bit too much. Judy. Having a strong work ethic is important, but in the Wesleyan Methodist ethic, it's not to benefit me, and it's certainly not to benefit the business owner. It's to benefit the poor. We work hard so that we can help more. We work hard so that we can help more. There's a book, I'm coming to a close, but there's a book I found in the archive that I've never heard of before, I've never seen it before, which is rare, called The Wesleyan Movement in the Industrial Revolution. And the author, who was a clergy person from the New York Annual Conference, who was a pastor here, but also wound up teaching uh, sociology of religion at NYU, um, the author, Wellman Warner, fundamentally grounded this economic ethic. He did an analysis of it, and he, but he grounded it in the idea that the Wesleys were committed to being fully awake to the present moment. And I think this is interesting and important because behind all of this language, all of this conversation about money and gifts and saving and gaining and giving, there's a deeper principle at work, which is that we're not letting ourselves become preoccupied with the past or even in preparing for the future that can get in the way of what God has put in front of us right now. The people God has put in front of us right now. In Wesley's own words, above all, do not make the care of future things a pretense for neglecting present duty. Live thou today. Be it thy earnest care to improve the present hour. This is your own and this is your all. The past is as nothing as though it has never been. The future is nothing to you. It is not yours. The future does not belong to us belongs to God. The only thing that does truly belong to us is the present moment and what we choose to do in it. And so Wesley concludes again, therefore, live today. Or, as Paul reasoned in his epistle, because the present form of the world is passing away. The kingdom of God is near. God is doing something new. And yes, we prepare for it, but we are not in control of the future. Nor are we beholden to the past because God is doing something new. And so Wesley gives us this injunction, gain all you can, save all you can, but crucially, Give all you can. God is doing something new and inviting us to participate. 
Christ has called his disciples to lay down their nets in order that they might embrace divine labor. So may we be a church and a people who embrace our holy vocation as they did, who take up the busyness of the kingdom, fully awake to the moment and working hard, not for our own self-aggrandizement, not to be possessed by our possessions, but so that we might raise up the hard pressed, that we too might clothe the naked and feed the hungry and care for the poor, to walk as Christ walked, trusting that the provider of all good things will repay to all according to their work.